Unpacking Mormonism is a subsidiary of Daisy Girl Communications, LLC. All content herein is intended for educational purposes only and does not replace the advice or counsel of your personal care provider. Hello and welcome back to our mini-series, Why Sarah Left the Church. This is number two um, within the Unpacking Mormonism and Other Religious Trauma podcast. I'm joined today by Mason, who is looking a little tired over there in his (laughs) salmon pink shirt. Yeah, hey, I'm here. Let's do this. Let's do this thing. So in our planning meeting, one of the things that I kind of ended our meeting with was that I feel like today's topic is still one of the most triggering topics for me. Um, And as um, I'm going to say procedural stuff that the church does um, and that it, it really, really bothers me. And so I'm calling out that I might get a little bit triggered and snippy um, on this podcast just because it, this is the one that I don't feel like I've had any kind of good resolution on with, with the church, which tells me that I'm probably still working through my own grief response when it comes to today's topic. I, I think that's good to recognize that it's that you haven't worked through it, recognize that it's still triggering for you. And yeah, so that's good. That's a good start. Now good, tell us what we're going to talk about. Good start in recognizing that it's an issue, not necessarily a good thing that it is an issue. Right. And well, and like everything that you're going to discuss, it's not necessarily an issue for some people and it's going to be a big issue for other people. It is a big issue for you. Um, and and that's OK. So. All righty. Tell us what we're going to talk about today. Today we're talking about tithing. <laughs> Boom. Yep. Yeah. All right, so tithing. So it's important for me to start this one in my childhood. Um, So my dad had rules for how us kids would um, be allowed to utilize our money. And when I say rules, um, these were mandated. Um, We were not given a choice. So our money was separated by percentages Um, according to my dad's feeling of what was appropriate and what wasn't appropriate. And those percentages were 50% of our income had to go into savings, 10% had to go to tithing, and then we had to contribute to fast offerings, even as children. And so by the time all was said and done, I was left with somewhere probably between 35 maybe 40% of my income, but usually about 35% left of any of the money that I made. Um, And that rule applied to all monies. It applied to tooth fairy money. It applied to Christmas money. It applied to birthday money. Um, We were forced to put our money in those... um, Shaft. I know, right? Got the shaft. We got the shaft. Well, and the other thing that was really interesting is that my dad had these little mason jars that, you know, had our name and what it was. So Sarah had a, you know, two mason jars, one for tithing, one for savings. And then when the little priesthood boys would come to the house on fast Sunday and collect fast offerings from us, I was expected to give some of my money to them for fast offerings. And oftentimes we would have like a morning family meeting because we knew they were coming and we had to fill out the little fast offering slip and put it in and, and then give that to the, um, ironic priesthood holders, these little 12 year olds, 12 and 13 year old boys that were coming around asking for money to feed the poor. Um, Now, I do believe and support parents in teaching their children how to save, um, how to give, how to be generous, how to spend wisely. That's definitely something that we've done with our kids. For our kids, we've started them off with like the Dave Ramsey financial peace stuff. Um, That's actually been a huge benefit because that is the curriculum that Uh, our school district uses here in Missouri. And so when our oldest son got to high school and they, he did the finance 
class here in the high school that he's in it or was in for Missouri, he was already pretty familiar with it because it was the Dave Ramsey stuff that we had introduced to them. Um, but I think Mason and I, I think we did a really good job of not forcing our children to do it. It was an encouragement. We probably were a little bit too pressuring on paying of tithing. Um, and we also did not make them put 50% of their income into savings. We felt like, you know, when, when you get up to adulthood, 50% into the savings of your very limited income, you know, starting your first jobs and those types of things was probably a little bit too high. So I think Mason and I, we actually did the same type of thing, but we did like 10% tithing, 10% savings, and then the rest of the kids could spend. And then we helped them set up things like, oh, if you're saving for a Lego thing, take some of your discretionary income and set that aside. Um, and we have some kids that would, you know, blow their entire money on candy and other kids that really learned how to save up for a Lego set or, or whatever. We did use the jar system there for a long time. And then about once a month, once every three months or so, our kids would fill out their tithing slips and give those to the bishop of that 10%. Um, but I also felt like we did a really good job of, instead of it being like, you have to pay 10%, because that's what you have to do. Um, we kind of explained to them, you know, that that money was going to help operating costs for the buildings. So, you know, the electric bill, the maintenance, the cleaning, cleaning supplies, and then anything left over was going to go to help feed the poor and the needy. And that we kind of talked to our kids about how you and I were contributing to fast offerings in order to beef up the funds that went in to feed the poor and the needy. Mason, would you agree with that? Uh, for me, there was always, you know, there's always that. There's always the question of where is this going to go? What's it going to do for it? But for me, the underlying issue was always, I believe God had commanded us to pay tithing and to give offerings. And so I did it f specifically and almost universally for that reason. Right. So for you, it was strict obedience you didn't necessarily put a lot of thought into what the church was doing with the money. It was, right. we were told 10% to get to the tithing, it's 10%. Right. And then if you wanted to give other offerings on top of that, great. Um, and yeah, that's where I sat. It was just, I did it because I felt like it was the right thing to do, that we'd been commanded to do it. And so I did it. Yeah. And I think that that really played out because once you and I got married, um, you were managing the finances, which made sense because you were um, working for the United States Postal Service uh, services at that time. You had been working for them for what, like a year before we got married? Um, yeah. 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 And I mean, you had a truck payment. We paid rent. Well, first we bought a trailer and parked that in your parents' backyard to avoid paying rent because... Yeah, that was interesting. Um, uh, for those of you who uh, don't know my husband, he hates spending money unless he has to. And even then, he hates spending money. Um, so, yeah, we, we didn't have a whole lot of bills or anything. You had your truck payment and then, of course, food. We spent a lot of your income on Disney VHS movies. <laughs> um and eating out at Denny's, which at the time, that was about the, you know, nicest restaurant that they had in the Pine Top Lakeside Sholo area that was not like gourmet, crazy expensive food, which we would have never done because both of us grew up, both of our parents were teachers. So we both grew up in low income. Pole boys. Family. Yeah. yeah, we were both pole boys. So... Mason was grossing, when we got married, Mason was grossing about $70,000 a year. Uh, he owned two highway contracts with the United States Postal Services, and he was delivering mail on those um, contracts. And so we were making really good money. And because Mason had been running his own bills for a year when we got married, I don't, I don't think it was even an option. Like, I think even in my own home, in my brain, my dad did the bills because he made the money. So when we got married, it was kind of like Mason's doing the bills because he's making the money and I'm a stay at home mom. Now I did have a job. I had, um, I worked for Arby's up until shortly before we got married. And then I did work study for Northland Pioneer College teaching dance and doing choreography for the, um, theater arts, 
um, program there at Northland Pioneer College. I didn't make a ton of money at it. Um, we probably just wasted that money. We did not save 50% of our income. Definitely not. Um, we didn't save hardly anything. We paid our bills and if had a great time. We go back, time. right? Right. Um, and then when Mason joined the military, um, so we went from about 70, he, Mason remembers 70,000. I remember $75,000 a year. Either way, when we joined the military, Mason went in as a private first class in the United States Army a long time ago. So you joined what year, Mason? 2002. 2002. Yep. And so our gross pay for the military was about $24,000 a year. So we took somewhere between a $46,000 and $50,000 a year pay cut, which would have been okay for us because we had bought a home. And when the realtor first came out and looked at the home, we said, hey, we got to sell the home because we've joined the military. I seem to remember we had somewhere between forty dollars and $60,000 of equity in the home. And so you joined the military. So we finalized Eric's adoption. Yep. You joined the military. The house was up on the market at a certain price. We were getting lots of looks at it. We went into contract right. on we the home. Offer, yep. We got an offer. We were going to walk away with somewhere, I want to say around fifty-five to sixty thousand dollars. I thought it was a lot smaller than that, but we were going to make money off of the purchase for sure. Right. And we our plan was we're going to pay off the debt, we're going to like get out of this timeshare that we had bought. Yeah, got, y'all, we were done with our money. Let me just tell you that right now. We bought a timeshare. We were like 20. We didn't even know how to vacation yet. Um, and so we had a timeshare and whatnot, but we were going to pay off all of our debt. So that way that huge pay cut wouldn't be so hard on us because we would have had very few financial obligations right. and we'd have been able to afford that. And uh, about two weeks after mm-hmm. Mason went into basic training... The Rodeo Chedeskai fire in Arizona burned up the forest around our home. Now, our home, the forest around our specific house, survived. We had some smoke damage in the home that, like, new carpets, new paint, that type of thing that was covered under the insurance. But the buyer of the home backed out. They didn't want the house anymore. And then property prices dropped. Um, shortly after that fire and we ended up having to short sale that home in order to get out from under it which means we took a huge loss and we were left with all of our debt so now we had you know, the financial obligations of making 70 grand a year and trying to meet those, making $24,000 a year. And long story short, we ended up having to file for bankruptcy. We just could not do it. Um, And when I look back at that bankruptcy, the things that we gave up in that bankruptcy, like we kept our car, it was a couple of credit cards and the timeshare that went away. Um, Yeah. We probably could have handled that differently, too, if we'd have known better, but we just didn't know at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, we just didn't know better at the time. But we were living in San Antonio. So because of the Rodeo Chedesky fire, um, I... Mason, when Mason joined the military, I got this letter of, if you have any questions or comments, contact these people, Captain so-and-so is his commander, Sergeant First Classes, you know, this person, these are his drill sergeants, he's assigned here. You understood all of it, of course. Right, Right. well, yeah, yeah, at that point, I was like, okay, this paper's important, I'll put it on the fridge, type of a thing. (laughs) Right. But then I got a letter or a like one of those two minute phone calls that you were allowed in basic training. And the instruction I got from Mason was you got that letter, Sarah, do not call them for anything. Like, don't contact them. Because when you do, the entire unit is going to get in trouble. And it's bad. Like this is basic training before 
basic trainees had their cell phones and right this was still real basic training this was still real basic well you know that depends if you talk to somebody who went through basic training (laughs) in the 40s 50s and 60s it was definitely different than that it was different than that but yeah so still real basic training where if i had called and you know whining about something then the drill sergeants would use that as an opportunity to smoke the unit and so i got this message from you mason don't call them and so I was like, okay, well, then I won't. Well, when the Rodeo Chedesky fire broke out and we got evacuated from our home, I was like, all right, this is this is an actual emergency. Because we have lots of those, by the way. We get lots of actual emergencies. Yeah, we really do. Um, so anyway, we... Uh, I called that number and I said, hi, this is Sarah Westbrook. I'm private first class Westbrook's wife. He's, you know, this is his unit. This is his whatever. I said, I don't need to talk to him. I just need somebody to get him the message that we are being evacuated from our home. And I am going to be with my parents. So if he needs anything, he needs to call me at my parents' house because we're being evacuated. And I think it was your captain who answered the phone because he said something along the lines of he'll be on the phone in 15. Well, first he said, um, how long before you leave your house? And I was like, honestly, the fire department is going door to door. Right. I'll be leaving in like 10 minutes. And um, he said, "Okay, I will get Westbrook on the phone. He'll be on the phone. He'll call you in like five minutes or whatever. And so they went out, Mace. What what happened for you with that? Uh, I was out doing some sort of field training. I don't remember what it was, but. So one of the drill sergeants showed up and called my name and didn't tell me anything that I recall. Just said, get in the truck. You have, you need to go or something. And so then I came back and called you and it was weird. I don't remember all the details because I'm not good at remembering all that stuff, but yeah. it was odd. And of course, no, they don't, drill sergeants do nothing in basic training to make you feel comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> it's always... You're going to be uncomfortable, even trouble, not trouble, did the right thing, did the wrong thing. doesn't matter. You're always uncomfortable in basic training. Yeah. So he called me. I told him I was going to be with my parents. And then one of the benefits of that is that Mason was then allowed to call home from the commander's suite. Like, I don't know which phone you use, but you were no longer on the pay phones with like the stupid. Not that time, but I was in the, I was after that. But I got to call you every night, yeah. which wasn't normal. Which wasn't normal. And you got to call me every night just to make sure things were good. And then I think you said they were letting you watch the news a little bit so that you could kind of track what was going on. Because this was national news. The Rodeo Chedesky yeah. fire burned like over a half million acres of ponderosa yep. pines in northeastern Arizona. So anyway, um, because of that, um, fire and then because our house was now being torn apart for the insurance claims I had nowhere to go like I was literally homeless um, and so the army when you graduated from basic training and you got stationed in San Antonio for your AIT or advanced individual training which for you was your training course to, medic, to, yeah. to, to be, be a, a combat, a combat medic, medic yep yeah. Um, the army gave me a compassionate move and they, they moved us, um, or they didn't move us there. No, they just let, you just decided to come. I moved there and, yeah. and they didn't, they didn't balk at that at all. Like they were like, whatever. And they let you come see me a little bit on the weekends. Like I would come pick you up. And then we would like eat dinner together. You would spend a little bit of time with Eric and then I'd have to drive you back. Like you got a two hour break in AIT in the evenings or something personal time. And I would come get you and we'd go home. But Eric and I lived in a teeny tiny one bedroom apartment. I put his crib in the walk-in closet. Um, (laughs) We were, we were so cramped there, but when Mason joined the military, I took over the finances because Mason was not in a position where he could make sure things were getting done. Right. And so I took over the finances. And for the remainder of your Army career, I did the finances all the way up until like the last year when I was like, hey, you're getting out and I'm kind of done with this bullshit. Your turn. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You did it for all so that time. I did the finances. And what ended up happening was with our teeny tiny paycheck, I would pay all of the bills 
And we would be left with literally five to ten dollars that was meant to cover. Like I could do one fill up of gas, I think, a month in the car. That's all I could afford. And then we were left with five to ten dollars a month for food. And I would spend that on a lot of rice, uh, a lot of beans. And then we lived off of our year supply, like the Mormon church really recommended a year supply. And during that time, I gained a testimony of we were paying our tithing, which meant the Lord was going to protect us. And I was living off of our year supply of food with supplemental beans and rice. Um, Eric was gratefully old enough. He was no longer on formula. And so I was able to, you know, feed him regular human food. Otherwise, I'd have died. And then the thought of food stamps or going to the church for help never even occurred to me because both of us grew up in homes where our parents were kind of anti-government and definitely anti-welfare. So my dad refused to go on welfare, even as a teacher at our absolute poorest. He took on extra jobs. And I remember my dad working in the upwards regularly three jobs and sometimes even four jobs. Like he would work his three jobs and do side jobs for um, my grandma and grandpa, my mom's parents. Right. Grandma and Grandpa T um, and whatnot. Or he would go to California and work in his dad's shop for um, a fourth job oftentimes trying to make ends meet. He was a very proud man and would never have asked for help. And then Mason, your family, they were so poor that they did dumpster diving to supplement your... A lot of good food in the dumpster. Food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mason's got an immune system like nobody else's business. Um, but yeah, your your grandpa would dumpster dive and your family lived off a lot of yeah. the dumpster diving food. So neither of our parents ever did that. And so for us, it just wasn't really even something that I thought about pursuing. In fact, I grew up in an environment where if you asked for food stamps, you were failing. And one of the funny things about the right. military is that those lower ranks are kind of set up with the expectation that you're going to supplement your income through the other government programs out there, through the WIC yeah. program and the food stamp program. We didn't start the WIC program until we were forced to when we became foster parents. And I was like, oh, no, 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 we can feed these foster kiddos by ourselves. And the state said, no, it's mandatory. If you're going to be a foster parent, you have to do WIC. And it was at that point that I put Eric and Brig on the WIC program too, which saved our butts because with Brig... He was allergic to regular infant formula, right. and he ended up having to go on Nutramogen, which was like $25 a can of formula, and that would have been right as opposed to 16 six to, to, six to 17 yeah. years ago. Yeah, it was it was crazy expensive. Yeah, because I don't know what formula is now, but it was like 6 to $8 for the regular stuff and, and 25 for the Nutramogen. And 24 25 yeah. for the Nutramogen. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. incredibly expensive, and so our doctor wrote a prescription for it in WIC, Ended up covering that so that Brig could actually eat. But I get ahead of myself. So we moved to San Antonio. And um, I've got my grocery list planned out. I've got, I don't know, 10 to 12 bucks for groceries. I'm get, getting ready to take Eric and I to the grocery store. We're going to fill up the car with our, you know, one fill up of gas. And then go to Walmart and buy the cheapest food that I can find that's going to supplement our year's supply. And when I get out to the parking lot of um, our apartment complex, I've got a completely, almost completely flat tire. And so I remember driving to the nearest gas station, putting a quarter in the machine, putting air in the tire, and then going to Walmart because I figured Walmart would be the cheapest place to get my tire repaired. And I actually, so I had a little miracle, um, and I wrote the story down and it got published in the Enzyme. So if you want to go in and read my story, it's called My Tithing Tire by Sarah Westbrook. It was published in the July 2005 Enzyme. Um, but long story short, I remember being absolutely devastated because I still had my tithing check in, in my hand. And at that point, we were making nothing. I would, I would say that that tithing check was somewhere around $120. Like it was not very much money, right. but at the time to feed just Eric and I, cause Mason was eating at the DFAC or the cafeteria right. at the army. So it was just Eric and I, $120 would have been enough for a month's worth of 
food, right? but I'd been commanded I had to pay tithing. And so I remember going, oh my goodness, I need to repair a tire. We need to buy milk. You know, we're just not going to make it this month. And I was feeling really overwhelmed. And so I said a prayer and whatnot. And I took a leap of faith and I put a stamp on the tithing envelope and I mailed it to the bishop. So I was not tempted to tear up that check. And then I put Eric in the car and I said, well, I'm just going to have to figure this, figure it out as I go. And I drove to Walmart and Walmart pulled me in. They, they told me that my tire was not repairable, that it would have to be replaced because the nail was in the side wall of the tire. And I was like, okay, fine. How much is that going to cost? And it was, I don't know, $125. And I sitting there like in my head, I'm like, I'm going to have to write a hot check. Like I need the tire. I can't not have a car. Right. And so I, my plan was I'm going to write a hot check and, and pray like crazy that nothing bounces and that we just have some sort of goofy miracle. Wasn't going to tell anybody about it. And about 30 minutes later, the um, tech from Walmart came back in and says, we can't get your tires off your car because you have locking lug nuts on the car and you don't have the lug nut lock removal thingy. So we, we were driving a Toyota Avalon and we didn't have the lug nut removal we key. Did. We did actually. In the Avalon. Neither one of us knew where it was. Yeah. Well, and apparently the tech didn't know where <laughs> it was either, either because <laughs> it was stored with the spare tire right in its little right. It was right there, cut out so. spot. But so anyway, we asked what they needed, what we needed to do. And they told us that pet boys could help us. And so they filled my tire up and I went out because I was like, no, I don't believe you. There's no way you need to repair my tire or replace my tire. And so they took me out to the bay and showed me the nail on that tire. And I saw it and they were right. It was definitely in the sidewall. And it was a pretty substantial nail. It was not just this little thin nail. It was one of those that had like the bigger, fatter like, head like more on of it. Almost a bolt. Yeah. I yeah. Almost a that. bolt. It was pretty bad. And I was just devastated. So they put enough air in my tire. I drove straight to Pet Boys. And then I sat in Pet Boys for probably four or five hours. I told them what was going on. Um, I told them that, you know, Walmart couldn't get the lock, locking lug nuts off, that I would need a new tire, blah, blah, blah. They gave me the quote. And then I just sat there and I prayed and I cried and I was overwhelmed. And I had let Mason know because I think I had a, did I have a cell phone or something at that point? I don't remember. I don't think so. I don't think so because I didn't get a cell phone until right before I don't think I deployed. heard about this until I was able to come for the weekend or whatever. I don't remember that timing. Yeah, but I just, I remember being devastated. And four or five hours later, the Pet Boys tech comes out to me and he says, so we got your tires off. We've run them through the water. We don't know what Walmart was talking about. There's not a nail in your, in your tire. And we did not, they did, they sent me on my way free of charge. I went to Walmart. I got my $10 worth of groceries, went home. And I was convinced that it was because I'd paid my tithing. Um, it was, for me, it was, it was a miracle um, and, yeah. and for me, it still is that, I mean, that really happened to me, you know, whether or not my tire was just magically by divine intervention repaired, my guess is that it was a, a whoops in the bay at pet boys. My guess is somebody probably repaired it or replaced it, put it back on the car and didn't and turn something in <laughs> and forgot about it. Cause I mean, I was there for, a, for waiting for four hours. Right, yeah. I was there a really long time, but it didn't matter how it had happened for me. My tire was repaired and it didn't cost me a dime. And I saw the nail in that tire. And so for me, this became a huge testimony bearing opportunity because I had a tire. I saw the nail. I paid my tithing. It cost me nothing. Right. And we drove on that set of tires. We did not get those tires replaced for at least three or four more years because we went from San Antonio, then we spent about 18 months in Washington. And then from Washington, we went to El Paso. And I don't think we replaced those tires until you had like some sign-on bonus or clothing disbursement where we got yeah. enough money. I mean, those tires were definitely bald by the time we <laughs> fixed them, but we didn't have any other issues with those tires. So no. for me, that was a huge testimony builder on the miracle of tithing. Um, and I lived on that all the way up until Hurricane Katrina. Uh, Mace, do you have anything you want to put in? Because when we were doing our planning meeting, this was kind of like, well, Sarah's going to be talking a lot. Mason's going to do some uh-huhs <laughs> in there on occasion. Well, yeah, because there's a lot of story. Because you're telling your story. Yeah. Uh, for me to jump in and, and 
you know, break that up. It's, it's hard. I'm not very good at that in the first place. You right. do a good job of interrupting me. I don't, yes, I, do. I have a hard time still with, with that, but, um, I had at one least on the thought. podcast. I had one thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one thought I'd listened to a podcast with Bill real, I don't know, several months ago, but he talked about, I think it was like four or five spiritual experiences that, that he had, even though now he's not a member of the church, that he still held those as powerful experiences in his life. Not ne- that they necessarily spoke to the truth of the church or anything like that, but they were par- powerful right. spiritual experiences in his life. And so I think it's important to recognize that whatever your belief is about God, if you believe in God, he's at work in your life. And I don't think that you lose anything by having these special experiences right. and attributing them to God. Maybe that's not what's going on. Uh, I'm certainly at a loss for myself right now in in that realm. But I think it's great that you can have those experiences and still hold them as special to you. Even if you define them differently now than you would have then, they're still special to you. And so it's nice to, to hear that. And of course, that's something that happened to someone very close to me. I wasn't really a part of that, although it affected me as well. I wasn't really a part of that. There was that episode with John Larson where he talked about, you know, the different types of miracles and like the one type, like the everyday miracles, like, oh my gosh, I can't find my keys. So I say a prayer and then I find my keys. And boom, there they are. And we're all like, you know, the human brain, you're, you're, you know, your keys are, that's not a miracle. Right. Well, and he compares it then again to, you know, all the stuff that's going on in the world. Well, God can help you with your keys, but he can't help people with water in Africa. Right. Right. And so... That causes all kinds of tension in my right. brain trying well, let to me, figure it out. Let me finish because you just totally interrupted oh, sorry. me. Sorry, on the I just, podcast. Oh, it's amazing. Shutting up now. Just as soon as you say I don't do it very often, you do it. <laughs> right. It's like, yeah, what is that? Freud, Murphy's Law. Anyway. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so, but then you know, like the tier two miracle for John Larson was, you know, the it happens frequently. But yeah, it could be a miracle, and you know, things like oh, I got in a car accident, my car was completely totaled, and I walked away without a scratch. You know, okay, well, yeah, for a lot of people, they wouldn't have that outcome, and and for you, you did. Right. So okay, that's right. you know, mir- miraculous there. And then like his tier three miracle was somebody cut off my arm and it grew back. That's right. that other miracle. The parting for of me, the Red Sea kind of stuff. Right. For me, this tithing tire thing was somewhere between that second and third tier like i saw the nail there's some sort of an explanation that i don't know but i do know that i walked away from pet boys and they claimed they didn't repair my tire or replace my tire and i didn't have to pay them any money and I went to the grocery store and spent my 10 to $12. Now, you would think that a, a real miracle or, or something else could have also been somebody saying, hey, why don't you guys get food stamps so you're not starving to death, right. you know, right. right here? Because Mason Mason would actually, he was limited in what he could get out of the defect, but I think you kind of snuck some food out of the defect and you would bring it home to Eric and I so that, you know, we could live off of things other than wheat and beans and rice right. and grain. And I mean, because at that time, our year supply was like oatmeal and wheat and sugar and oil. And so, I mean, Eric and I were living off of bread and rice yeah. and beans. And I mean, I did not, it, it was, that was a really difficult time. That was when we were at our absolute poorest yeah, still hard to hear that yes. yeah and I did not go get the help that was available to me because in my home I was taught that it was wrong to right. ask right for help and and we definitely I mean yeah we were stupid in our spending when we were making seventy thousand dollars but who can expect the type of financial burden because of a forest fire and losing the equity of our right. home like we had a good plan in place. Right. That just got effed up because Mother Nature did Mother Nature. (laughs) Right. Um, So when Hurricane Katrina hit, 
um, I remember a huge media story coming out, and I think it was Hurricane Katrina. It may have been another one. I mean, we've only been... Like, we, we got hit by it in 2011. Our community got destroyed by a tornado. Pretty sure it was Katrina, because you the kids went to Houston to help with that. Yeah, but that would have happened after the tornado. So my timeline oh. on some of these stories is not going to be in chronological order. I apologize. But I do remember when Hurricane Katrina hit, there were some media stories that were really bagging on some of the big charities out there. So, you know, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, they were talking about the CEOs, you know, million dollar salaries. And I remember our local leaders coming out and reassuring us that if we were going to give money to help for these types of causes that we needed to be really cautious in donating to the government programs um, and these other, you know, the American Red Cross, Salvation Army, whatever, because only five cents of our dollar was actually making it to where we wanted it to go. And if we donated it through the church, then we could be rest assured that that money was in the Lord's hands and that it was getting to where it needed to go. And I remember at the time that was huge for me. That was like a reinforcement. So Mason, you and I kicked up our humanitarian aid donations. We were in a better financial position. So we increased how much we were giving in fast offerings, which was meant to right. feed the the poor and the hungry and clothe the naked. Um, we, we increased, you know, we started donating to the humanitarian aid project. So that way we could do those things. Um, but then we had some other, again, natural disaster. I'm telling you, do not live next to the Westbrooks, y'all. Your house is going to flood. You're going to get hit by a hurricane, a tornado, or a fire. Like, the only thing we have not done, knock on wood, is a volcano <laughs> at this point in our lives. So uh, yeah. we're living in Fayetteville, North Carolina. It's 2011. I've just had my youngest biological child, um, who is now 11, and a tornado rips through our community in Fayetteville. And my experience was the church increased its effort to bring food and resources and repair. And you and I, Mason, got to be a part of that because our yeah. bishop was busy doing something in the army. Our Relief Society president was like at home in Chile visiting family. And Mason was the first counselor in the bishopric. And I was the primary president and you and I took over like the distribution of a lot of those things. And so yeah. like we, the, the food came out of the Bishop's storehouse. You and I put them in boxes. We were delivering them. Like we headed up quite a bit of that and not a hundred percent of that. I know that our Bishop at the time did a lot. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember where the second counselor and the young women's president were. They were doing something else. So, Mason was the first counselor in the bishopric. I was the primary president. And the second counselor in the bishopric's wife was the young women's president. So there was a lot of crossover in leadership in that ward during that time. And I don't remember where they were. I think they were out of town for something as well. It just so happened to hit. And you and I were kind of the go-tos for the first little bit right. there. And so we did that. Um, it was an incredible experience. But looking back on that, the food went to members of our ward that were hit. They did not go to the community at large that had been hit. Right, at least not that we were aware not of. Not that we were aware yeah. of. And then when we organized the efforts for cleanup, we were cutting trees and moving trees and cleaning up members of the ward's homes who had been hit, very little was done for members who were, or for people in the community who were not Mormon. And as I look back on that, I kind of wonder, did we miss what the church did? Or were we only doing that? But the other thing that happened for me is that about the same time, I was doing my practicum for my graduate program. So I hadn't graduated with my master's degree yet, but I was doing some practicum stuff. And as part of that, I volunteered with another church community to offer acute mental health resources and crisis management and whatnot. And we joined up with some community efforts and some other church efforts. And when the Mormon church did a, we're going to feed the, you know, the workers and the rescue and whatnot, it was basically like a ward potluck with maybe one family from the community that came to that. 
But when I went to this other churches in this community event where they were doing basically the same thing, there were close to like 800 participants that came in, got food. They were able to basically go shopping on their own. Like we weren't delivering specific items. It it was like kind of a free for all. They came in. If you had a baby, there were diapers, there were this. Nobody was monitoring what was taken. Um, They had cots and tents and generators and air conditioners. Like what the community in this other church had done, like just swallowed up what the Mormon church had done in the exact same community. And at the time, it didn't bother me because at the time, I didn't know how wealthy the Mormon church was. So we're talking about 2011. Um, Some of the things that, that I thought that the Mormon church was, you know, very humble in their financial um, place and their circumstances was the operating budgets. You know, I was the primary president a few years later, I was the young women's president in another ward and our operating budgets were really, really small, except for the scouting program. The scouting program got a pretty good chunk of change. Like I want to say that their budget was triple what mine was as a primary president or the, the boy scouting program. Part of my budget right. was triple what my budget was for everything else. But then I also had Eric at that time who was a part of the young men's scouting program and he was always frustrated because their budget was going to replace camping gear that had been destroyed that they had just purchased the year previously and hadn't put away correctly so they were constantly replacing equipment with their budget so they didn't have the budget to do any of the other things that they had planned and we were only allowed to do one fundraiser at a time and I remember Mason you and I and we did this for, for several years as our yeah. kids, like we like outbid, it was almost like, look at the rich Westbrook family. They're outbidding everybody else on these dessert auctions. And that was not our intent at all. Our mm-hmm. intent was because we were both in leadership, we knew how much it cost to send our kids to these church programs. And so right. we made sure that we contributed enough in the dessert auction to cover at least the minimum amount for our children to go and and usually one or two extra children to go as well. Like that was our goal. We wanted to get our kids out there and not have the church's budget cover our children going because the money wasn't there. Like right. it was there, but we were told that it wasn't there. And then we would take all those freaking desserts that we earned and we would have like a little, like in Colleen, we had like a cul-de-sac party. We called all the neighbors in the cul-de-sac and we were like, we have a ton of dessert. Come join us in the front yard. And we just yeah, like, we're not eating all this. Yeah, we're not eating all this. <laughs> and so we had this like community party. So all of my friends from Colleen, Texas and our little Comanche to neighborhood cul-de-sac. Do you remember all those dessert parties that we had? You know who you are? Yeah, that was because we had just spent money to make sure that the church did not have to pay for our children to be involved in girls camp, boy scout camp, scout camp, right? all of those things. We wanted to make sure because the church was poor. Um, another experience that I think is really important to share is that when we were in Fayetteville, we had some teenagers across the street from us that basically we adopted them. They almost lived at our house more than they lived anywhere else. And they wanted to join the church. So they took the missionary discussions and they joined the church. And there was a lot of concern about them joining the church because as teenagers, they wouldn't have the parental support to keep them in the church. And the leadership was concerned about having their names on the records of the church, but no way of contacting them and keeping them engaged. And I didn't understand that at the time because my thought is, baptize them so they can get back to heaven because isn't that like a saving ordinance and even if they have limited understanding they've at least got the seeds planted and as they get older they can do with those as they want but those teenagers that were living across the street from us were starving their dad was taking their food stamp money and selling it off and getting drugs and drinking and they weren't working and their mother was disabled and so I remember going to the church at this point in leadership and saying hey I think we need to get the this family some food from the storehouse and the concern was well no because dad's just gonna sell that 
for drugs. And I was really frustrated because I've got two teenagers who are literally starving. Like they're not being fed. If they're at the school, they get like the school lunches. But if they're at home on the weekends, there was not at that time in that community a weekend buddy pack system so that the kids would get fed. And so I went to the bishop and I was like, you know, my thoughts are, can we pack some sandwiches and get them, you know, some little oatmeal cups or some individual cereals and some milk so that way they would at least be fed. So let's not give them money. Let's not pay their bills, but let's at least bring in food. And if we're bringing in, you know, like turkey, uh, pre-made turkey and cheese sandwiches, their dad is not going to be able to sell that for drugs on the street. Like that is not going to fetch a price on the streets and so we're we're kind of controlling the fact that dad's not going to spend the money on drugs but that these two teenagers who are now a member of our ward congregation would not be starving and the answer was still no and i really struggled with that answer and what ended up happening was they just came to our house and ate with our family like we fed the neighborhood kids quite a bit we've got i've got two kiddos that came to our house for meals all the time Uh, when we were in Fayetteville, and they're basically my sons. Like, I love them as if they were sons. They visit us on the holidays. One of them joined the military and has spent a couple of weekends with us. Like, they were really close to my son Eric, really good friends, and they're my kids. Like, they're just an extension of my family. Um, And yes, the church offered help, but because there was drug use or abuse in the home, they were really cautious with what they would give. And Looking back on that, it that really bothers me because we weren't talking about giving money. We were talking about feeding the poor and the hungry. And I'm kind of upset with myself that I did not notice at that time that what was being withheld was, you know, life essentials. Right. These weren't comforts. And now as a counselor, when I look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and it comes to, you know, creative problem solving and how you figure things out, you have to have food, water, shelter, clothing. And if those things are not in place, you can't figure out your own problems. Like our brain doesn't let us. Right. Um, when we got to Colleen and I, um, at, by the time we got to Colleen, I had graduated from my master's program, and I went into private practice for the first time. And I was the only LDS counselor for like a 90-mile radius. And so I went from opening my clinic to being completely booked in probably just a couple of weeks. Um, I never struggled to cover my overhead. I didn't even have to do any major marketing, anything, because once the bishops got word that I was there, I was, I was completely booked. And several of those bishops would pay for counseling services. And it was really that, you know, bishops roulette. Some bishops were like, I trust you. I trust your, you know, clinical expertise. You just send me the bill. And when the person's graduated from therapy, let me know and I'll stop paying. But they didn't put any limits on that. And, and one of the things that was really interesting is those clients made the most progress. Because there was no limit. It was, you go, you see Sarah. And a lot of the bishops would be like, I want them to pay $5 for their session and and we'll pay the rest. And so at that point, the um, industry standard price for reimbursement of counseling services was somewhere between $80 and $100 an hour. And because the church was paying for it, if the church was reimbursing, I gave them a significant discount and I charged them somewhere between $50 and $90. I think when I first started, it was $50. And then as I got into it, definitely by the time I got here to Missouri, I was like, I cannot accept less than $90 right. and keep my doors open, especially when the majority of my clients and Colleen were LDS. I could not continue to do that. I remember giving them a very steep discount because I wanted to help the church out because once again, I was in this brain space of the church doesn't have the money. Well, the other issue is then I've got these bishops who, number one, what I can share with the bishops is very limited because of HIPAA. 
Right. But I do have a release of information for every client that the bishop is paying for to give them enough information that I can give them treatment recommendations. I'm allowed to let them know that, you know, things like I could say, I don't feel like this issue is going to be resolved for at least six months. I need to see them weekly for six months. I could say those types of things. I could send the bill, but I had to be very limited. And there were a couple of bishops that would say things like, we're only going to approve three sessions. Like, you've got three section, sessions with a therapist to figure this out. And I'm going to tell you right now, in therapy, three sessions is what I need to get to know you and make sure that we're meshing well enough that, and that we're in the right brain space to really begin the therapeutic work. So deep therapy in three sessions, not possible. Um, I remember having one client that was a chronic victim of domestic violence in her home. Uh, she wanted to leave her partner, and the bishop had told her that that was a sin. And so they sent them to me for marriage therapy. I was able to identify quite quickly that the gentleman um, met the diagnostic criteria for what's called characterological domestic violence. And the um, standard for characterological domestic violence is the couple needs to separate, and they need to get counseling on their own. We do not do marriage therapy for couples where one of the partners is an is a character lot character a logical abuser. Meaning that say that fast three times. I know, right? <laughs> so situational domestic violence means we got heated, we got in an argument, things got out of hand and there was a violent incident versus character logical domestic violence is it doesn't matter what's going on, there's going to be violence in the home. And so the industry standard, evidence-based treatment, all of these things that I am held to on my license is that these two people need to separate and have their own individual therapy. And the bishop was upset because I called him. I said, this is what's going on. This is what needs to happen. He said, no, that's not, that's not what's right. They need to stay married. You know, we need to honor the temple covenants that they've made, so on and so forth. But he also limited me to six sessions. And I told him over and over, I was like, I cannot fix this in six sessions. This is an issue that's been going on in their marriage for over 20 years. Six sessions is absolutely not enough. And he said, well, it's, that's not my problem. They need to get a job. He needs to hold down a job. Well, he didn't hold down a job. He worked from home so he could control his wife and his children's every move. And he wanted his wife to get the job. And the wife who was the victim didn't feel comfortable getting a job because her children were not safe with him. And so she was trying to do things like deliver pizzas with the kids in the back of the car. I ended up charging them $15 a session after the bishop stopped paying because she needed help. And I am grateful to say, like $15 a session, I had to collect something. Like I can't just see them for free. Um, that, that, that becomes an ethical issue and a conflict of issue conflict of interest issue. So I charged them $15 a session. She was delivering pizzas. And I'm grateful to say that she actually reached out to me about six months ago and she got divorced. Like they got a new bishop. The new bishop paid for real counseling. That counselor, I had already moved away. That counselor also told her, you need to get divorced. This isn't fixable. She got divorced. She got full custody of the kids. The bishop helped pay for schooling and food and rent and everything so that she could go to school, get a career. And now she's got a career able to support her kiddos. Her kiddos are older. They're not as little. So they're in school. You know, life has changed for her for the better. And she reached out to me to say, thank you. You were right all along. And she talked about how hard it was and that she actually left the church because the bishop, you know, he was like, I've prayed about it and God told me. And she's like, God is telling you these things, but this is the situation that I'm in. And that happens right. an awful lot. And for me, my thought was the bishop is limiting the funds because they don't have them. So fast forward to, I don't even remember when it was, I think, I want to say 2017, but don't quote me on that when there is a huge IRS leak and that the church's overall worth and assets is estimated at over $130 billion. And the current day estimates are as high as 180 to $200 billion. I felt betrayed. Because the last time I looked at it, um, before this got a lot of media attention, the church was giving somewhere between four and $16 million a year 
in humanitarian aid, but they were an over billion dollar corporation for years. Like you don't get up to $130 billion in a day. This is years and years of wise investing. And you know what? Way to go church, way to go investors. You've done some things right in being able to build this wealth. But I was absolutely disgusted by this $130 billion number with, I'll say, $16 million in humanitarian aid. Like, that's what, less than a nickel per dollar donated going to humanitarian aid, going to the things that they claim that they're doing. And then even at this most recent conference, they estimated that it's about $900 million that's gone to aid. And I can't help but go, hmm, that number's gone up substantially because you're getting a lot of negative media attention. But even at $900 million, if the church truly is worth $200 billion, and they're giving, we'll say, a billion in humanitarian aid, and it costs them an estimated seven to fourteen billion to run operating costs. You're still giving less than what one percent, Mason. What is that? I don't know. I can't follow the numbers that quickly. It's not, but it's not ten percent, right? It's not. It's disgusting. Yeah. It's disgusting. What could what could the church do with that money? And then I went through a lot of grief and I added it up. Mason and I have donated somewhere around a quarter of a million dollars in tithing and fast offering and other things to the Mormon church in our 23-year marriage. And if we had that quarter of a million dollars that we had invested on our own over the last 23 years, where would we be financially? And I feel like just us on our own, that we could have donated to people in need and that we would have done better with our $250,000 that went to the church than the church did with it. So I started to feel, there's a lot of anger here for me. What I did next was that I compared, I got online and I looked it up. Mormon church is the wealthiest church in the world with seemingly one of the smallest congregations. Even if we go off the church's numbers of 16 million members, um, which, by the way, if we have 16 million members and the church gives $16 million in humanitarian aid, we'll say around 2017, that means that of the money that I donated, they only spent a dollar of it. So 16 million members, $16 million, they spent $1 of the money I donated to humanitarian aid out of the th- Ten to twelve thousand a year that we donated. Right, one dollar per person. Yeah. One dollar per person on the record. Um, that was just disgusting. So I was really angry. Um, I would absolutely love to jump onto a lawsuit and sue the church for lying to its members about how they were using the money. Because if you want to donate to the Mormon Church, fine. But I think you have the right to know where that money is going. Most of the charities I work with nowadays are very transparent. They, they show us the same forms they give the IRS. This is how much we brought in, and this is what we did with it. Um, Most agencies are required to do that. In, uh, when we do the CFC, which is the Central Campaign for Donations for the Army, they give you a whole booklet of who you can donate to, and it'll tell you what their general operating costs are or how much of what you give them actually goes to whatever you're giving them for. Like the Red Cross is like 95% or something goes yeah. to their stuff. Like they have very low operating costs, whereas others are, are not like that. So you have that information. Well, and you and I went to that, um, I think it was a Baptist church with one of the kids' friends about four or five months ago and right in the program you walked into their main service and it had the month's expenditures it had we've collected this month so far we spent this much here this much here this is going into this this is like it was right there right on the freaking program like and then they were saying hey we've got a savings goal for this if we can meet this we're going to have a barbecue and this is what we are going to do with those funds like it was very transparent the other thing that really bothers me is even if, so so the church started calculating service hours and there's a lot of rumors and I'm going to say rumors because I don't think we can substantiate this. I haven't seen anything source material where this can be substantiated, but that that $900 million that they reported in this most recent general conference of giving 
I think they've put a dollar amount on service hours. I think that's the assumption by a lot of people that they actually have not increased what they're giving. They've just reallocated how the money is being reported in order to make it look better than it actually is. But once again, even if it was a billion dollars, when you're a $200 billion church, $1 billion is pretty shitty. Um, I mean, it sounds like a ton of money and it is a ton of money but it's just oh just like I said this is really triggering for me y'all the other thing that really bothers me about the Mormon giving is in my previous examples is that the majority of it majority of it is incestual giving which isn't really helpful like Jesus did not just like, I don't know where I believe or what my personal belief is on the Jesus from the Bible. If he was the historical Jesus or if he is, in fact, the Messiah, I'm still working that out in my head. But one of the things that I know from the New Testament is that he did not just feed the members who agreed with him who are a part of his community. He healed, he fed without discretion. It was if you needed help, he gave help. They didn't put all these rules and limitations on it like he suggested saying thank you. He suggested doing things, but it was not a requirement to receive funds. Um, so it's very impersonal. You know, you go to these machines at Christmas time and you buy a goat for somebody in Africa, but you never actually get to see the goat delivered. And hey, y'all, I was just in Europe and Turkey and Italy, and they seem to be doing pretty good on their goats. Like, I'm not exactly certain how that program works, but I feel like it's a marketing ploy to get more money. And then the thing is, is that the church takes credit for that. And it just, it it makes me really sick. So yeah, I'm, I'm going through a lot of um, grief of how those things happened well then it it's obvious that it's it's a big issue for you and i think that that should be noted and that it you know i it's good that you're going through this and i know that you're not the only one i'm sure there's lots of people out there who are right. struggling with this idea and not necessarily with tithing in general like you said but in particular the way that it is getting used in the the mormon right. church well, and one of the other things that's really concerning to me is that when we were in Fayetteville, you were an officer by then. So, you know, you're a first lieutenant, second lieutenant, captain. So we were making more money. But as I said earlier, we got hit by a lot of natural disasters. So with the tornado that hit in 2011, we had to get a new roof. But then Fayetteville got hit by a string of torrential downpours and the rains that came from some hurricanes that hit the East Coast. And our home flooded three times. So it was a tri-level home and the basement flooded. And the first time, the insurance company covered it. And the second and third time, they did not. And Mason, you and I had to pay for that out of pocket. By the time we sold that house, we estimated that we had put so we bought the house for what, one hundred and twenty-four, hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. One twenty-four, yeah. One twenty-four. We sold it for one twenty-four. Yep. <laughs> and almost a decade later. Yep. And yep. in necessary repairs due to storm damage that was not covered by the insurance company, and then we had to replace the air conditioner and heating unit and the ductwork twice in that house due to things that were completely out of our control. Like we're talking unexpected. This was not because of neglect. This was just life bit us. We spent over $100,000 repairing that home. We also were paying for adoption costs. Um, so just to give you all an idea, the average adoption in the United States costs about $35,000 to adopt through an agency. Uh, probably about $20,000 if you're not utilizing an agency, but that gets really risky if you don't know what you're doing um, on average. And that, that money is not guaranteed. So at one point um, before we adopted Abigail, we had twins that we were trying to adopt and then another baby that we were trying to adopt. We paid for the process to get going, and then when the birth parents changed their mind for whatever reason, we lost that money. So we have spent in our marriage also about $100,000, $125,000 in adoption costs to adopt mm -hmm. our four children. Um, 
we were broke, even though we had a pretty solid income because of these natural disasters and whatnot, we were broke. And I think over the course of our marriage, we asked the church to help us. So we got fed for about two or three months when we were in El Paso at one point. And then when we were in North Carolina, I think they paid for our mortgage for two months. And then here in Missouri, we got our mortgage. They helped us pay for our mortgage um, one or two months. So of that $250,000 that we put into the system, the church probably helped us with, I'll, I'll be really generous and say maybe $10,000 back. Um, and that's really generous. It was probably closer to five to $6,000. Well, not the, the Missouri house is a much higher. So I'll stick with $10,000 back to us, which I am incredibly grateful for that we right. had the help in those that's times. That's why that program exists. Yeah. Right. But we also had to go to friends and family and take out astronomical loans and credit card debt in order to pay for the flooding of our home. And we continued to pay tithing because we were told that the Lord would provide. And really what ended up happening is we were on the brink of bankruptcy once again while making more money in our marriage than we had ever made before y'all with with that cost with those natural disasters and the amount of credit card debt and the interest rates and and whatnot and yeah there was fema and yeah we were declared a natural disaster area but we were on the brink of bankruptcy for a second time because of natural disasters Then we moved to Missouri. Y'all, we moved to Missouri. And I had lived here for about four months, and another tornado hit Missouri (laughs) right down the street from us. Gratefully, our home was spared that time, but I swear, do not move next to the Westbrooks. You're going to get hit. But I really struggle with the idea when I hear stories and conference talks of if you don't have any food in the house, pay tithing, the Lord will provide. Because we've been to the point of starving or losing a house or on the verge of bankruptcy. Paying the church twelve to fifteen hundred dollars a month in tithing, and then racking up credit card debt and putting ourselves in a horrible financial position, where if we had stopped paying tithing and had used that fifteen hundred dollars a month, we probably would have never been anywhere close to bankruptcy again. We wouldn't have borrowed money from family and friends to help us clear that up. We are still paying off a loan because life bit us in the butt to a friend, which is just, it's, it's hard. And I'm unbelievably grateful for the friends who were able to do that for us. You know who you are and we love you and we are deeply humbled by the help that you're willing to give. But you know what? If we had stopped paying tithing back in Fayetteville, I don't think we would have needed it. I think we'd have done okay. Um, And we definitely would not have racked up the amount of credit card debt trying to put our house back together. When we sold that house in Fayetteville, I felt bad for the people who bought it. I'm not kidding, listeners. We outlined every natural disaster. I like wrote it out detail by detail what had happened to that home. And the people who bought it had to have been first time home buyers because they didn't give a crap and they bought the house. And I've never been more relieved to get rid of a money pit. And we couldn't file for bankruptcy or allow that house to go back to the bank because Mason would have lost his top secret security clearance with the military, which he had to have in order to keep his job. So that was that was really that was really difficult. <clears throat> Do you have anything you want to add, Mason, before I close us up on this one? Um Oh, I remember. I have one more thing. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. <laughs> okay, When go. I left the church, I came to Mason. I was so upset about this one that I told Mason I absolutely refused to stay in the marriage if he continued to pay tithing to the Mormon church. I told him that the Mormon church didn't need our money to operate, that the Mormon church would not be hurt at all if we didn't do it, but that I absolutely in good conscience could not continue to contribute to the Mormon church in tithing. And I, and I threatened you with divorce. This was one of those like deal breakers for me, which was 100% not fair to you. Cause I kind of came to you and I was like, this is it. And I didn't give you a voice in that. 
I don't remember that for tithing. I, you've threatened me with divorce over some of the stuff that we're talking about, but I don't remember that over tithing. Oh, I, I remember threatening you for mm-hmm. that over tithing, which I'm here to say, y'all, not the healthiest way to handle it. Um, I share that because I want my listeners to understand the depth of my anger and anguish yeah. over this issue. Well, and I think that that's a good clarification there too, just that the issue obviously matters a lot to you. And sometimes I'm thick headed. I'm, I'm <laughs> sure there's other people out there who have the, have the same experience where you just don't get how important the issue is to somebody else until they use language that makes it important, right? You finally get it because of the, you know, in this case, what you're saying, you know, they threatened divorce over tithing. Well, if nothing else, it ought to make it clear to me that it, it matters a great deal to you. And, and that's what it did. And we've kind of worked out that issue and kind of not yet, but yeah, I was going to say that when we were in a better brain space, we talked about, you know, we still want that goal to be 10%. And that we were going to split that 10%. So Mason, you would take 5% of that 10% and I would take 5% of that 10%. And we would give it however we felt appropriate to charities that were meaningful to us. And if you felt that that was to the Mormon church, then I wouldn't say anything about it. And so we've we've come to a much healthier place now um, with that. But I think the other thing is that when Joseph Smith initiated tithing, it was never meant to be 10% of our income. Um, That it was 10% of your increase, meaning after all of your obligations are paid, whatever you have left over, it was supposed to be 10% of that, and it was meant to be personal. And somewhere along the line, and I'm not going to go into where along the line because that is not my expertise for more information, hit up Mormonism Live. Mason, are you going to look for that podcast? Well, no, no. As to which one. So there's a Mormonism live episode where they kind of break that down with the tithing thing that's got the source material. So if you're interested in the source material, do your search, head head over to Mormonism live. They've done a good job. But I would say today it still makes me physically ill. Like I struggle with nausea and deep, deep shame to know that the money that I donated to the Mormon church has lined the pockets of corporate crazies so lined corporate pockets that that money has been used to protect child abusers that that money is being used to trap BYU and church employees into having to do things the way the church wants them to or their jobs and livelihoods are at risk I hate the fact that that is where my money and and I can say that my money is still being used for that because if they invested that money the returns on that money that I gave are still going to that, and it just disgusts me. Um, And that it did not go to aid the poor, to bring medication to the sick, to bring water, clean water, to people who don't have the financial or the infrastructure to do that. And that I do not feel that that money has been used in a way that was meaningful for the world, the way that the church brags about it. I do not trust their numbers. I feel like I have really good reason not to trust their numbers. But the betrayal about how I chose to give money for generosity so that people's and communities and the world's lives could be better, that it's not doing that, it makes me physically ill and I cannot be a part of an organization that does that. I just, I cannot. And so for me, this is probably the one that it makes me the most enraged still. Tithing issues in the way that the church misuses the funds and is misrepresented to its membership, what they're doing with, with those charitable donations and the way that they're able to get away with it as a nonprofit organization is absolutely disgusting to me. And I refuse to be a part of it anymore. And so in my 5% of the charitable contributions that Mason and I give of our income, it will never go to the Mormon church again. But it absolutely will go to things that are personal, that I am passionate about, 
and that I feel truly brings positive change in the world today and for the future. Well, thank you for sharing. Obviously a hard topic for you. I, yeah. I disagree with some of what you've said about all of that. And, you know, that's, that's my right, yeah, of course. I, I read it differently than you do. I, and I think that that's still a possibility for people just to recognize that you can see this situation differently. Some people are going to see it exactly the way, they, the way that you saw it, that at the very least, it would seem like the church could be doing a lot more to help uh, individuals and communities around the world. Um, maybe they are, maybe they're not, right? But that's at the very least they mm -hmm. could be doing more. So at the, at the most, they could be doing a lot more. Um, they certainly could be more transparent about their finances. Absolutely. Um, and not being transparent about your finances does not necessarily mean that there's some sort of corruption going on. Right. But it sure is... It sure is indicative of that a lot. You know, Trump has been fighting that for years now. Like they want to see his taxes. He won't show them. You know, it makes you wonder, is there some sort of corruption going on or is it just that, hey, this isn't your place to see it? But right. the point being, it, it doesn't smell right when that is what's going on. Well, and when, so when you talk about Trump, I start to get a little squirrely over here, too. I want to bring out the point um, that when this first came up in our marriage, I didn't handle it in a healthy manner. There, there was a very inappropriate power dynamic. Yes, it makes sense, but it wasn't the way that we need to talk about this issue. And I want, so, you know, that, that was kind of our worst when it came to yeah. talking about the tithing issue, me saying, absolutely not, or I'm leaving, I'm out of this marriage was not a healthy way to handle it. Where we are today, where we agree on some and disagree on some, and we're kind of like in the gray area on most of it, but the fact that we are still comfortably engaging and discussing this, I think is, is oh, really important, important to piece. point yeah. out because if we can do it, y'all. So money has been a touchy spot for Mason and I in our marriage forever because we just, we look at money very differently and yeah. I know we're not alone in that money is a, is a big conf point of contention and conflict in lots of marriages. Yep. And so for us to be able to talk about this issue in, I'm going to say what Mason, 96% of the time we're pretty civil and we can agree to disagree and move on and it doesn't ruin our day and we're doing pretty good. 96% of the time we've gotten to a place where we can discuss this well. And that 4% of the time where we F it up, it's usually because we're tired, we're hungry, we're stressed, yeah. the kids have been rough, and so if we can just take a minute and step back. But yeah, Mason, I kind of want to echo what you said. Not everybody's going to see it the same way that I did. This is a hot topic, and so you've yeah. got to be able to approach it in the mindset of it's not right or wrong within our home. Um I, Sarah Westbrook, am personally choosing to never contribute to them again because I don't trust them. Mason, you have the right to do something differently, um, and that's fair, and that we need to learn how to be accepting of people's opinions and, and viewpoints. We have to recognize it on this issue. There's a limited amount of solid evidence, and the solid evidence that's there I, I, Mason, I would say that you agree with me that the, the evidence that's there that's like tangible that we actually have is really concerning. Absolutely. But we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Absolutely. So. And I'm still in the place where I am <clears throat> willing to give them the benefit of the doubt, right? And um, But I, I want to reiterate, this is your story, right? right? We're not here to argue about tithing, whether or not it should be paid or the benefits or whatever that could be done with it, Right. We're not here to talk about miracles that might come from it. That's that's not the, the point of this podcast. It's to show that this is one of the big issues for you. Consequently, it can easily be translated into the fact that it's a big issue for a lot of people and not just in Mormonism. Lots of people are asked to pay a tithing to whatever church they belong to. And it is a difficult issue for people. And so we want to be able to see it from a different pers perspective. 
we want to be able to hold space for the people who struggle with it and recognize why. Because yeah. some people, yeah, okay, fine. Maybe they're just greedy, right? A lot of people, there are real issues there that make it a struggle for them. So this is your story. I want to make sure that I, I keep that clear because ultimately what we want to do is is where do we go from here, right? Like we're demonstrating here that you and I don't completely agree on this issue. That's okay. I'm not interrupting you to try and say, no, that's not how it is because it's your story. And I, I want us to be able as a community to communicate better on the issues so that something like this does not destroy something more important like a relationship. Yes, Sarah, you have your hand up. Oh, I didn't. I raised I'm my <laughs> hand. No, well, and I just wanted to say, Mason, I absolutely love that you used the words holding space because I feel like how you and I have gotten to a place where we can talk about this in our marriage and not have it, you know, deteriorate into an argument is that you do a really good job of holding space for me and that just because you disagree or just because you're validating my point of view does not mean that you agree with it, but that as we hold space for each other's viewpoints that that we can get a lot farther. And so I just want to make sure that I give you a shout out. Thank well, you thank so you. much for holding space. This comes back to the whole reason I'm doing this mini series. Like I have not shared these concerns really with anybody other than certainly you. not in this way, not this complete right in this yeah. complete story. And the yeah. reason is because there I have not had an opportunity. I have not yet had a person that's been able to hear this and and them not get mad. Because when we start talking about the Mormon church misusing tithing money. Oh, it's a big deal. It's, it's a big deal. It's a it's a it's, it's a big a trigger people. point. And you know, I don't remember who it was. It was a family member. I don't know if it was my mom or if it was one of your family members or something before my mom and I stopped talking um, and whatnot. But it was like, no, that can't be. The church would never do that. Right. And right. I'm like, you're shutting me up and minimizing without looking at the evidence. So yeah. I would say go out there, do your own research because mm -hmm. there, there are some tangible pieces of evidence out there that raise a lot of red flags. And if you don't believe me, Look at how much change the church has been reporting and how much they've been giving over the last few years. Yeah. That's from negative, in my opinion, that's from negative media attention. It's gone up. That should be raising some red flags for those who are still members. Like, why did we go from 16 million to 900 million in just a couple of years? Is that good old Russell M. Nelson just firing away as a prophet? Or is it because the church is getting a lot of bad media? Right. Well, and I want to add to, I appreciate you saying that, you know, I've, I've done a good job of holding space. I want you all to know that that has taken a lot of time, <laughs> right? Specifically the last couple of years, but also my, my whole life we've worked on, you and I together, we've worked on being able to hold space for each other and only really of late has it been with opposing opinions. So I'm still learning on that, and so are you. We, we succeed more than we fail, but there was at least one threat of divorce and at least two offers of divorce in that process. Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's been rough. It's been a difficult journey. But I'm here to say that we can make difficult journeys. We can do what we need to do to get to where we need to be. And in this case, a, a strong marital relationship, giving my children both parents together, that was really important to me. And so we've made some changes. We've made some sacrifices. We've done the things that we feel like we've needed to do to accomplish that. Right. The and use of Mormon tithing funds, the way the Mormon church uses their tithing funds is not a valid reason for you and I to get divorced. Right, right. So we had to find space because it was a big deal for you. Um, so we had to find space, but we've worked on it. So I just want to thank you all for being here. We absolutely love having you on the other end of this. Shout out to all of those who are listening. Um, our big community areas, we love it. We're grateful for the support. We hope that it is helping. Ultimately, that is what we want, is for this to help relationships, to help people to heal from struggle and from trauma that's related to religion. And 
we're grateful for those of you that have reached out to to let us know that that is what is going on. That means an awful lot to us. So please do that. And we will talk to you later. Unpacking Mormonism and Other Religious Trauma is hosted by me, Sarah Westbrook, and my husband, Mason Westbrook. Produced by Daisy Girl Communications and Alex Vidalis. Our music today was Moving Forward by Run to Life. And I hope you know by John Worthy Music.